Hey everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. We are continuing our series diving into what we expect from the upcoming Wheel of Time television show. This is part three of the series and in this video we're going to tackle some of the challenges that Rafe Judkins and the team are going to face bringing the Wheel of Time to life on the small screen. Adapting a literary work for television or movies is always difficult and adapting a series that is as long and as complicated as the Wheel of Time is is an absolutely daunting task. Many fans of the series are cautiously holding their breath hoping that Rafe and the team will be able to make the right choices and give us the Wheel of Time show that we've always wanted. But there are some major challenges standing in the way and in this video we're going to take a look at the challenges themselves and then I'll give my opinion on not only what I think they should do but also what I believe will happen based on what we know so far about the series. This list will not contain anything about what characters and what storylines from the novels I think will be cut from the show as I will be addressing that in an upcoming video in this series. If you have not checked out the previous episodes in the series, make sure to check those out. You can just start with the Wheel of Time television playlist and let it play through to see them all in order. I will have a link to that below in the description. Before we get it into the meat of the video, I want to let you guys know that I have some exciting channel news and a very cool present for a lot of you at the very end of this video. So make sure to stay till the very end for the special announcements. But let's go ahead and get started with this video tackling the five biggest challenges facing the Wheel of Time crew and how they can overcome them when making the show. We'll start by throwing up a spoiler rating. The spoiler rating for this video will be red. It will contain major spoilers that will span the entire length of the series. Please watch at your own risk. Since this video is going to be extremely long already, let's go ahead and kick it off by talking about the first of the major challenges facing the show, and that is how they're going to handle channeling. So unlike Game of Thrones, the most popular fantasy adaptation to date, Wheel of Time is heavily reliant on its magic system for the story, and it's so heavily intertwined with every part of the plot that if this is done poorly, it can really sabotage the show's success. So what are the major challenges facing the showrunners when it comes to showing the channeling of the One Power? Well, there are a couple notable difficulties they are going to need to overcome. For one, how will the weaves themselves be shown? What does it look like to create a fireball? Will the individual threads of the One Power be shown, or will we just see the finished product? There will be many scenes in the books where weaves themselves are described. How will a shield be shown? Will we see a different color for each of the five powers? Will there be a difference in the way Sidene is shown as opposed to Sidar? More importantly, how will the showrunners tackle the idea that only channelers can see the weaves, or that men can't see women's weaves and vice versa? Also, another issue with magic in television shows is that typically it has a cheesy and hokey look. This can be a major turnoff from making the television show reach a mainstream audience. One of the advantages that Game of Thrones seemingly has is that it felt more like a political drama from the beginning rather than a show about magic and dragons, which it actually is at its core. So let's go ahead and tackle these issues one at a time. First of all, in regards to how weaves themselves will be shown, I think we can pull some cues from how they're described in the books. The term weaving is an interweaving of various strings or flows of the various five powers. These can be shown to weave together to create various webs and patterns that create a desired effect. After being being shown on screen enough times, the audience will be able to tell which weave is being performed based on the pattern and the flows necessary. The key here is consistency. There will be times where some exposition is necessary to explain the various flows and what they are, but I believe this can start as early as the scene where Egwene learns from Moraine very early in book one after escaping the two rivers while they're sitting by the fire. Moraine can explain how the one power works in a way that actually educates the audience and Egwene. After we learn this stuff, we can recognize the weave and they can give us visual cues so we know what is being done. For instance, if yellow threads of the power symbolized spirit, we might see a solid yellow disc over the head of a shielded channeler demonstrating they can't channel and the glow of the power disappearing around their body. But what about non-channelers? Will we always be able to see the flows? Will they be able to see the weaving? I believe that the showrunners will selectively show us channeling. I think that much of the time we will simply see the effects of channeling but not the flows themselves. There will be times, though, where it's necessary to see them, and there will be times where it's not. A way they can accomplish this is by cutting back and forth from different angles or points of view that show the flows and some that don't, effectively demonstrating that only some characters can see this. While this sounds complicated to describe, it will actually be fairly simple from a cinematography point of view. Music and sound effects can also be utilized to further demonstrate the difference between seeing from a channeler's point of view and that from a non-channeler. It will simply take training the audience to understand what they are seeing. 
The real challenge with channeling, in my opinion, making it look cool without another way of putting it. If it looks cheesy and hokey, as I said, I think the show suffers. Well, one thing that gives us hope here is the way magic was handled in the Marvel movie Doctor Strange. They were able to make it look essentially cool. It took a large CGI budget, but they pulled it off. I think a significant investment budget-wise is going to be needed to make channeling look distinct and exciting without looking like cheesy traditional fantasy magic. So what do I think is going to happen? I think Rafe Judkins knows this is something important, and the success of the show is dependent on this looking real and having the cool factor. I think if the budget is as I predicted in my previous video, that they're going to invest heavily in the CGI necessary to make Chainling really pop on the screen. I trust the creative minds on that team and their dedication to making the show look great, and given the proper budget, I think this can turn out really well. So since we are talking about the need for CGI when showing channeling, let's talk about the use of practical effects and CGI. This is not necessarily a challenge, but more so a very important choice the team will need to make when creating the series. Let's first define what these things mean. Practical effects are, are special effects that are produced physically, without the use of computers to generate images. For instance, creating real costumes and large and small scale sets are practical effects. An example of a movie series that used a large amount of practical effects was the original Lord of the Rings trilogy. Most of the orcs, Minas Tirith, Rivendell, and other sets were actually small scale models or extremely realistic costumes. CGI stands for computer generated images, and this really just means any effects that are created using a computer or filmed with a green screen. A good example here is actually the Hobbit trilogy. Peter Jackson decided to shift to CGI rather than practical effects, and it was quite noticeable. So which is better and which should they choose for the Wheel of Time? Well, really neither of them is wrong and both styles have their uses. For example, CGI is gonna be needed to show channeling properly. The question is, will CGI be used with Shadow Spawn? What about the sets? Will Kamelin be a pure CGI creation or will they need to create a small scale model similar to what they did with Minas Tirith? Will battle scenes need to employ tons of extras or will they be simulated with CGI? These are choices facing the production team. So what's the right answer? I believe the more the more they can rely on practical effects, the better the quality of the show. I would like to see elaborate costume designs designed for close-up shots, even for Shadow Spawn. I want the Trollocs to look extremely menacing and real. Given the difficulty of creating humanoid forms with CGI that don't look fake, I want to see these be real. I think when you get wide-angle battle shots, CGI is going to be totally fine, but anything close I want to see in practical effects. Obviously, budget is a factor with this as well, but creating sets for each of the major locations in the series is going to add to the realism. Part of the massive cost of the HBO series Rome was the need to construct massive period set pieces to show ancient Rome. There are quite a few locations needed in the Wheel of Time. I think they are going to need to use CGI, as in the case of these cities, because it'll end up being cheaper. For instance, showing the enormous city of Tarvalin will need to be CGI. I think they can create small scale sets for major landscape shots and I would love to see that but I think we can expect CGI to be used in a similar way to King's Landing or Winterfell are shown in Game of Thrones. I think the path to success here is to use practical effects as much as possible but using CGI when necessary and using it tastefully. So this is something that is always an issue with adaptations, and that is pacing. The pacing of a book series is different than that of a movie or a television series, and you can accomplish different things in each medium. Given that there is going to be quite a bit of condensing of plots and characters to make the book into a series, I think it's going to be important to get the pacing correct. It's going to be tempting to make the series one action-packed set after another, but one of the things that makes the, the book series special is character development. It absolutely cannot work if character moments are sacrificed just for big plot moments or big scenes. One of the things that Game of Thrones has done well is balance big sweeping action scenes with one-on-one -on -one character moments that humanize the characters and make us care. A good example from Game of Thrones is the scenes with Cersei in season one. She has a heart-to-heart -heart moment with Catelyn Stark as she sits next to her son's bed. She later speaks candidly with Robert about what their marriage could have been. These are moments that make her a human and not a one-dimensional villain. These are the types of moments that are needed to make us care about the characters. I want to see the the Forsaken have conversations. I want to see them feel like real people. If they're just mustache twirling villains, it's really going to take away from the story. I want to see the story slow down and deep dive into our characters' motivations. These are things that are going to be necessary to make the show resonate and connect with fans and viewers, as these are the moments that make us love the novels. Another challenge with pacing will be balancing the sheer number of plot lines that are going on at any one moment. With such a large world, there will be a need for various points of view and locations active at a time. This is another thing that Game of Thrones has done very well with, but there are not as many main characters
chapters as there are with the Wheel of Time. For instance, during the cleansing of Sidene, one of the biggest moments in the book series, there are at least 10 concurrent plot lines going on in different parts of the world. Rand and his team at Shadar Logoth, the Forsaken there opposing him, Elaine in Camelin with the other nobles outside the city opposing her, Matt escaping Ebudar with Tuon, though Shan Chan chasing Tuon, Perrin chasing Fael, Fael and her crew in Malden with the Shido, the Black Aja hunters in the White Tower, Egwene and the rebels camping and then leaving to attack right outside the White Tower, Loghain and the Ashaman, Taim and his Ashaman, the list goes on. These are all going on at the same time. This is going to be the major challenge to adapt and pace the show well. So what do I think they're going to do? The good news on the pacing front is that the novels are well paced and have quite a few heart-to-heart -heart moments and quite a few cinematic moments that will be used as visual spectacles and crowd pleasers. As long as there's a balance between both of those where we get to drive depth into our characters and have those giant visual spectacles and crowd pleasing and big battles, they're going to have a great framework to start building in crafting a great dramatic television series that will leave us wanting more each week. The books are really setting them up to do well with this. How they will handle the multiple plot lines will be to keep each episode focused on just three to four of the concurrent plots rather than trying to hit all over the place. They will need to cut out the unneeded plot lines or just focus on them less, but this can be pulled off well. My hope is that they do not cut away too many plots as I believe the complicated and intricate story is one of the things that makes The Wheel of Time such a masterpiece. <laughs> So I did an informal poll on Twitter last week asking what specific item Wheel of Time fans believed that Rafe and his team absolutely needed to get right for the show to be a success in their eyes. And the overwhelming answer with 40% of the vote was that they needed to nail the casting. I really think there is a lot of truth to this. Having strong actors and actresses will carry this show, and having poor ones is going to sink it. The Wheel of Time is known for character depth and dealing with some tough issues. The characters will be forced to evolve in personality and maturity as the series goes on, and this is going to require having strong performers. I will not be doing my own fan casting in this video, as this one is going to be long enough already, but I will give some basic guidelines I hope they follow when casting the show. And don't worry, I will be making a casting video here soon. So let's start with some basics about what I want to see in the casting. I want to see the main characters, meaning Matt, Rand, Perrin, Egwene, Elaine, Nynaeve, to be mostly unknown actors and actresses with really good acting chops. I think it would be a distraction if one of them was super famous already, but these performers, especially whoever plays Rand, are going to need to carry the series on their backs. Whoever plays Rand, for instance, will need to be able to show the weight on his shoulders as he realizes who and what he is, be able to show the hard and firm personality that he develops, and deal with the madness that creeps up bit by bit throughout the novels. This is going to take some serious acting. All of the main characters have major character moments, and for this series to be a success, these young actors and actresses are going to have to be very high caliber. When it comes to the side characters, such as Tom Marilyn, Moraine, who is actually more of a main character at the beginning, Lan, the Forsaken, Galad, Cad Swain, here is where I'd like to see them incorporate some established and successful older performers. Like I said, I will get into specific casting choices in another video, but I think the casting can make or break this show. One more note on casting before we move on to our final challenge facing the showrunners, and that is the subject of skin color and diversity when it comes to the Wheel of Time. While Robert Jordan wrote a story with a very very racially diverse world with many different cultures and customs, our main characters are all Caucasian, and the darker skin cultures tend to be exotic in nature and even villainous in the case of the Sharans. This is something I believe that will need to be addressed in the television show. While I do not want to see major changes to the careful cultural themes that Robert Jordan created, I think that having diversity shown throughout the world and having some characters where it will not change the story, be more diverse, will add something to the television series. For instance, Tara Bonners or Altar could be played by African-American actors. The Shinarans could be primarily Asian. These are just some random examples, but this would be one way they could tackle that problem. Another way the issue could be approached, and this would probably be the most inclusive, but also the least similar to the source material, would be just to have all different skin colors and cultures and races represented equally in all of the different cultures in the book. So for instance, in Camelin, you just see a very, very diverse crowd. Same thing in the Borderlands, same thing in Tyr, same thing in Ilion. My problem with this route is Robert Jordan does a lot with physical descriptions to define certain cultures within the books. So this would change some of those descriptions quite a bit. I'm interested here which route you would like them to take in the comments below. 
So I think one of the more divisive issues in the Wheel of Time community is how the tone and the feel from the books will translate to the television screen. With some Wheel of Time fans fearing that they don't want the Wheel of Time television show to be a gore-filled sex romp that they think that the Game of Thrones television show has turned into. There is certainly a perception that the Wheel of Time is a far less graphic and basically PG-13 fantasy if you consider Lord of the Rings G-rated and Game of Thrones as R-rated. I think there is a serious fear among the community that the overall feel and tone of the television show will not match that of the books. So I think before answering this question, it's going to be really important to understand why the perception of the books being kind of PG-13 exists in the first place. The reality is, is that the Wheel of Time is far from being PG-13. The violence is incredibly graphic, described in detail. Bodies are maimed, they literally explode, people are tortured, mutilated, and the dead bodies of adults and children are left as warnings strung about or even put up on poles. This is just the violence in the series. The book series is full of nudity, far more so even than A Song of Ice and Fire. The customs of at least three different cultures within the series are laden with nudity, in addition to many customs and rituals in other cultures all being performed nude. You may say that there is very little sexually explicit behavior, and while you would be right that it is not described in detail, it does happen often. There are certain scenes where it's even important to the story, such as Rand and Avienda's igloo scene. Rape and sexual assault are also present within the story. The only area the books are actually more PG-13 is in the language. Robert Jordan created his own swear words for the series. So the characters within the story, they are dropping what we would consider F-bombs left and right, especially Matt and Brigitte and Uno and sometimes Elaine. But to us, they're just endearing terms that we've kind of all adopted. Light, blood and bloody ashes. I believe it is the language that has actually given us the feeling that the book series is more okay for children, for instance, than Game of Thrones. A lot of how you interpret the books is how you want to view them. That's going to be a lot more difficult to replicate when you have to show everything visually. So the question becomes, do we want to see a PG-13 version of The Wheel of Time, or do we want them to make it as authentic to the books as they can? I'll start by telling you my opinion on the matter, and then I'll let you know what I think is going to happen. I know this will start a debate, so let's keep it civil in the comments as we give our opinions. I believe they should keep the show true to the books in every way. I think the nudity is key to the story at times, and while I do not want gratuitous sex and violence, I think oftentimes the nudity is important to the cultural norms, as well as the fish-out-of-water feel that our main characters have as they meet and interact with new cultures. I think the violence is necessary. I want Dumai's Wells to be incredibly violent, and almost leave us disgusted at how war in general has changed with the use of the One Power. I think it's important that we feel the revolt that the characters feel as they see the bodies and heads of, of other humans literally explode and the scale of the death that a few men channeling are able to produce. I do not, however, want there to be forced sex where it shouldn't be. I don't think we need to see physical thrusting every time Matt meets a barmaid that he takes a liking to just to drive sensation into the story. It just doesn't need that. But on the other side of that, I don't want them to cut out the meaningful sex scene. I'll go back to my example with Rand and Avienda. This should be shown in its entirety. We should feel the awkwardness as they do this for the first time. Because they've been trying to avoid each other and they can't hold their emotions in any longer. It's real and the show should not hide from showing that to give us an authentic experience. That's going to drive character depth. So to sum up my thoughts, I want the show to feel authentic without needing to add in new sex scenes or anything new just to make it interesting. I think the story stands on its own without that. One area I am unsure though of how they'll handle will be the language because this goes back to the tone. The swear words that Jordan created for the novels fit the tone for the novels very well, but I'm a bit worried about how it will translate to television as they're trying to attract new fans to the series and they may not get it and it may just come across as campy and hokey. I think that if they keep Jordan's swear words, they're going to need to establish what they mean in a very serious way that doesn't make us feel like we're watching a 1950s era television show with people saying, oh drat, or golly gee. It needs to feel authentic and real, and that these are normal things that people would say. So how do I think they're going to handle it all? Well actually, I think the way I laid out is probably the route they're going to go. Rafe has said that they will be modernizing it a bit. I think that means that we're going to have more obviously LBGTQ characters and a more racially diverse cast. Unfortunately for all of you out there who want to keep the blood and bloody ashes and the lights and all that, I think 
it also means that we're going to have normal swear words from our language into the television show. Because that just relates to the audiences that haven't read the books. I think you're still going to hear those Robert Jordan swear words, but they'll also be next to our common swear words of today. I think that based on other adaptations, we will see some nudity in the early episodes where it shouldn't be, because that seems to be the formula for these television shows to drive interest for a new audience. And while I really don't want to see that, if statistically it does bring in new fans to the series, I'm willing to put up with it if it means the show gets renewed and more money to make future seasons. Typically after shows get renewed, they kind of tone it down on the nudity and sex, and that's kind of exactly what Game of Thrones did after its first couple seasons. Well, that's it, folks. Five major challenges facing Rafe and the team and how I believe they can overcome them and give us the show that we all want. I know this is going to start a lot of debate because we're all so passionate about this series. I want there to be a healthy debate down in the comments, but please keep it civil. Um, I don't catch them all, but personal attacks on anyone or being rude to anybody is going to get your comment deleted. And lastly, as I mentioned at the beginning of this massively long video, um, I have a couple huge announcements for the channel going forward. And I'll probably address these a little bit more in a Q&A video that I'm putting together for later this week, but I am going to be devoting more time to the channel here in the near future. And to help help me grow, I've started a Patreon page for those that want to support what we're doing here on the channel and want to see more content. My goal has always been to grow the Wheel of Time community and create a place to spark discussion about the show from a visual medium. If you feel like you want to support what I'm doing here, please check out my Patreon page um, down in the link below and, and really check out some of the cool reward tiers we put together. I've started a, a Discord channel as well so we can interact a lot more personally. I would really love to chat with you guys. I also have one more really cool announcement for all of you. Due to the channel's growth, I've partnered up with Audible.com to offer a really cool perk to my viewers here. If you haven't checked out the Wheel of Time audiobooks, I highly recommend them. Kate Redding and Michael Kramer are amazing. And Audible is now offering all of you that are watching this video a free audiobook. If you don't currently have an audio Audible description, follow the link below to sign up for, for a free one-month trial with Audible and you'll get a free audiobook of your choice. I have all of the Wheel of Time audiobooks with Audible and I love them. If you decide to keep the service, you'll get charged about $15 a month and you'll get another book each month that you can keep, even if you decide to cancel the series. There is absolutely no obligation to keep Audible after the free trial, so you can actually get a free book with with zero obligation. How cool is that? Follow the link below to get your free audiobook and help support the channel's growth. Hey guys, I know this was a long one, but thank you for supporting the channel and make sure to check out both the Patreon and the Audible free trial below. And one last thing, I will be doing a Q&A later this week. I've already got a bunch of different questions that people want to ask me, but if you do have some other things you want to ask that are Wheel of Time related, or maybe even just personal about what motivates me to do this, please also put those down in the comments below. I'll try to get to as many as I can in the Q&A. Hey, until next time guys, take care. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. Mistress up above, slipping on the rope of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free. Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?